I'm so excited to have Melissa Friedman here today. And Melissa, you're joining us from Tellur Telluride, Colorado. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I have been watching you post uh, about teaching primary series in Colorado. And mm -hmm. so I'm really excited to ask you questions about yoga and all of those great things. I also just want to make mention that people can find, we can find you on Instagram and you have a handle called at Nectar of the Bee and mm -hmm. also at the Medicine Beads. And so I'm curious if you can uh, first explain what the Nectar of the Bee site is. Uh -huh. So that is, um, that's my paintings. I'm a painter. Um, and yeah, it's, um, so I had a little yoga studio um, a few years ago that, I actually turned into a little art gallery at one point. Um, and the art gallery was called Nectar Arts. So um, my name, Melissa, means honeybee. And I've always had a, an affinity to honeybees. Um, so a lot of like the names of my things have centered around bees and nectar and um so nectar of the bee is just it's my instagram for my for my paintings for my artwork cool yeah did you was the yoga studio in telluride mm -hmm. yep it nice. was just a tiny little space and i originally had uh opened it to do yoga therapy and and just one-on-one -on -one work with people and then i had other teachers using it for just really small classes for a while what yeah. time frame was that during um, gosh, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's 2023 right now. <laughs> I'm I know. I'm trying to think. So it was a space I, I had, I had a studio, um, for, I'm a body worker. I was a body worker for a long time. I had a studio and this little space opened up right next to it in the same building. Um, and I just kind of jumped on it and because I needed a place to do my yoga therapy and I had a space for it, but it wasn't quite big enough. Um, so I want to say it's 2000, I don't know, 12, maybe yeah. something like that to until I went on maternity leave in 2019. So, oh, nice. yeah. And so I'm curious, what came first, body work or yoga practice? Um, body work came first. I mean, I had started, I had started exploring yoga before that, for sure. Um, I probably got into meditation first when I was just like 14 years old or something like that. Um, and so I started exploring yoga, I would say in college for a little bit. Um, and then I think I, the body work, my interest in body work kind of led me into a deeper interest in yoga and just the body in general. Um, so yeah, I became a body worker before a yoga teacher, before I was like cool. crazy passionate about yoga. Yeah. yeah. Where did you, uh, let me back, let me back up a little bit. Where did you grow up? I grew up outside of Boston, mm -hmm. Massachusetts. How did you find yourself landing in Telluride? Um, my sister, I have two older sisters and one of my sisters moved here first and, um, I came to visit her and just fell in love with this area. So that's cool. Where yeah. did you go to body work school at? I went to a school called, um, Pacific college of body work and awareness. It was in Kauai. Nice. I have heard of that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cool. And the founder, Lee Joseph, um, he passed away a couple of years ago, a few years ago now. Um, but he was just an amazing human being. And um, that was kind of where my journey started with it. And it just, you know, evolved from there. Was that in Hanalei in Kauai or? Um, his school at the time, um, and I'm not sure if it stayed there after you know, years after I left, um, 
was in, it was, have you been to Kauai? <laughs> I have not I've been yeah, to some yeah. of the other Hawaiian islands, but I yeah. just wanted to go to Hanalei because it's a pretty epic surf destination or right. all of Kauai, yeah. but. Sure. It wasn't in, it wasn't in Hanalei. It was kind of in between towns. So I don't mm -hmm. know technically where it was. It was like in between Kapa'a and, um, and what's the other town? Uh, I can't think of what it's called right now. Okay. That's um, right. But it was just like, it was down a long winding road and he had this beautiful property. And so the school was a separate building on his property. Um, yeah. Nice. Had you known that you wanted to get licensed as a massage therapist or certified and then consciously went to Kauai to study there? Or were you just hanging out on Kauai and realized this is what I want to do and and met them and and, and went there? Um, actually, I was living here and started looking into um, massage schools. And um, I had heard about Kauai and that I had to go there, all that. It was just kind of kismet. I, you know, asked around and another yeah. therapist here said, oh, my goodness, you've got to check out my teacher that I studied with. And um, I looked at several schools. And the second I had a phone conversation with um, Lee Joseph. I just knew that he was my teacher and, um, yeah, that's how I, that's how cool. I chose. Yeah. Were the fundamentals in Swedish massage or was, was he trained in everything and blended everything into the training? Um, I would say that the fundamentals were more, um, rolfing based structural body work. And, um, he also part of the program was hypnotherapy. So a lot of what we did was very psychosomatic centered, you know, getting into the body and finding what was stored there emotionally and really getting to the root of why we get stuck. Nice. Yeah. Did you come across Lomi Lomi as well when you were there? Um, I never experienced Lomi Lomi and I, I never, you know, took a training in it or anything, but it definitely fascinates me. Yeah. Nice. Just, haven't crossed paths with it yet. So that's cool. I had an opportunity to take a Lomi Lomi course on the big island of Hawaii with a man named Dr. Dang Kiolane Silva. And uh, it was really a, a great experience. And I love Hawaii. And uh, I can't think of a better place to go to massage school. So that's amazing that you went to Kauai. That's cool. Do you, do you still practice body work or are you retired from <laughs> massage therapy? <laughs> Because if Much. you're an artist and a yoga teacher <laughs> and um, making jewelry, yeah, uh, there's only so much time in the day. And you're a mom. Uh, how? What are you focusing these days on? What is your current? Um, how are you interacting with the public in terms of your work and your career? Yeah. So, um, so right around when I went on maternity leave in 2019. Um, to have my daughter, the the building I'd had my studios in for 18 years um, was going under reconstruction. So it was just kind of perfect timing. I don't know if I ever would have left <laughs> that building, mm -hmm. but um, I had to move out of my offices and was also getting ready to have a baby. I was eight months pregnant and still doing a little bit of body work. Um, and so I had my baby and then coronavirus hit like when she was three or four months old. So um, I think maybe intuitively I already knew that that having a young child and getting back into body work was wasn't going to mix so much for me. Yep. Um, so so I haven't um, I haven't been doing body work, but I did go back to teaching yoga. Um, cool. and so I've been teaching classes and, um, trying to get sort of my private yoga practice back up and running. Um, I had been doing yoga therapy with people for many years, um, along with my body work practice. So I try to incorporate that a little bit in my classes, but, mm -hmm. you know, it just depends on what I'm teaching. If I'm teaching more Ashtanga based classes, it's not it doesn't flow as much to do that, but, um, 
and it's more individual. So, so that's where I'm at. Um, yeah, being a mom and doing, investing myself in, in the yoga and, um, yeah, trying to find time for art as well. <laughs> I hear you being a parent. Um, we have like maybe an hour in the evening after they've gone to bed to where, you know, we can do something like yeah. art. And then you're so tired that it's like, do I <laughs> do I have the energy? Where are you, if you create a piece of work or in terms of painting and or and you also make jewelry? That's mm -hmm. cool. When when do you fit that in? Usually do you try to get up before your little one wakes up? Do you try to squeeze it in during the day? How how are you structuring your creative uh creative time? Yeah. Um well, I do, I do a lot of creative projects with her. Um, she just started preschool a few weeks ago. So, so she's, she's in school now three days a week. Um, yeah, I try to just kind of fit it in where I can. Um, I haven't been painting since I had her other than all the painting we do together. Um, I, I did a show while I was pregnant. And then since then I, um, I haven't really been going at it for myself. Um, so that's something I'm hoping to revive um, in the next little while. The jewelry, um, I've always kind of made jewelry, but while coronavirus was like, while we were all shut down, I taught myself a new technique that I really got into and created the medicine beads. And um, a lot of what I've been doing has been like really personalized, special orders and, um, so I can do some of that with her. And part of the reason I wanted to get into doing jewelry was because I felt like, well, this is something I can kind of do with her here and she can get into it too a yeah. little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I just find time where I can recently. Lately, I, I put her to bed and I go to bed too. <laughs> just to kind of right. go, go through those cycles of like, staying up after she's in bed and then also just wanting to snuggle in with her yeah. where I can. Um, but yeah. Yeah. That's so. cool. Can you explain a little bit what the medicine beads represent and, or what the technique is for working with them? Um, I started, so they've become very popular. Those like beaded earrings, they're, you know, kind of like the technique is called brick stitch. They're, they're like these, beaded earrings with fringe and um you know I just started like I love I love all the colors you can use I love you know the design you can do any design you know that you can draw you can create um and for me it's become like a way of creating a painting that's not a painting it's like a beaded painting almost like so many of the images that I create, just, I feel like I'm painting, but with beads, if that makes sense. It's like, I'm weaving these images together. And um, they're all, every pair of earrings I make has some sort of symbology to it. Like a lot of um, my special orders are like, can you make me something that incorporates this energy and this energy? And, um, and then I've started using some semi-precious stones in with um, in with the jewelry as well that represent different things. Um, but the seed beads I use, they're, they're like glass Japanese seed beads. Um, so yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Can you give me a history of how, if you're practicing and teaching Ashtanga now, was that your first method of yoga that you started to practice or what different styles, uh, have you come across in your yoga history? Yeah. Um, so I would say when I first really started um, practicing regularly, I was taking probably vinyasa classes and um, also really uh, appreciate Iyengar yoga and was taking a lot of, you know, Iyengar workshops and things like that as well. And then um, I started practicing Ashtanga. Um, probably a few years into my yoga practice and it just nailed it for me. It was like, it kind of just upped the ante on my commitment and um, felt like home to me as far as a lineage went. And so 
Um, so I started practicing with um, a teacher that I ended up apprenticing with years later. Um, yeah, I just got hooked and eventually, you know, traveled to India and never really thought about becoming a teacher. It wasn't on my radar. I just really loved the practice and loved, um, it just became some such a huge part of my life. And I think it was shortly after I returned from India, um, the teacher and that I had that ran the Ashtanga program for many years here. Um, she just kind of approached me and said, Hey, you know, do you want to apprentice with me? Would you like to be a teacher? And, um, you know, of course I was honored. And so I did, I would say like a two year apprenticeship with her where we really got down to business and I, you know, assisted her classes and, um, yeah. Uh, so that was kind of where the, the like teacher training aspect began and um, she got certified as a school so that she could certify me and um, so that was where yeah the yoga teaching started and I ended up loving being a teacher so it was nice. a really nice surprise really <laughs> that's cool is there a, a strong Ashtanga yoga community in Telluride um when she was teaching um there was there definitely was a really strong community um she left and i continued uh teaching the program for a while I, I don't remember the timeline exactly um but i eventually um i got sick and injured and had to give up teaching or i chose to give up teaching for a while um it was just too much with my body work uh, practice and um and then uh, a friend who I adore, she's, she started up a program again, uh, I don't know, a few years ago, maybe um, somewhere in me ending and, and her beginning. Um, so yeah, so there is a, an Ashtanga community. It's small, um, but we're slowly trying, trying to rebuild the, the community. Um, yeah. She's teaching regularly. I was covering for her. Um, and assisting her with some big classes over the last couple of years and then realized like, okay, I'm, this feels good. I like to be teaching again. And so I started. Um, so yeah, it's small, but it's, it's there. It's mighty, but small. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. That's cool. Is Telluride more transient or like, are the people that are coming to classes, are they like locals that live year round or do you have like a huge influx during the snow season and then like a huge influx during the summer season, maybe in relation to like the natural beauty for people that want to come just to do hiking. And I'm sure there's every sort of like mountain biking and rock climbing and fun Colorado type experience available. So do you yeah. find that there's a lot of people that are traveling, always traveling in, or is it more like a tight knit local group that are are there year round? Yeah say a little bit of both um I think within the community that um this like the strong community that we had going years ago when I started teaching we would definitely have um you know the Ashtanga community is kind of global and you you find it where you are and we definitely had some travelers you know finding us and coming to class um because it was their lineage of choice and yeah. Um, now I, I don't know if I can really speak to it. I would say it's a mostly local crew of people. Yeah. Um, but you know, in the classes that I've been teaching, um, just vinyasa classes or Ashtanga based classes, um, it's a mixture, but I would say the majority yeah. of people that are here year round are part of the year. You know. That's yeah. cool. What is the name of the yoga studio that you teach at? So I am, um, I am teaching, I'm back teaching at Telluride Yoga Center, which is where I taught years ago under different ownership. So I just recently returned to that studio, I was teaching for another lovely studio here called Practice, um, which is where my, my friend who, who's running the Ashtanga program over there, she, she's over there. So yeah, so I was covering her there for a little while as well. Nice. Mm -hmm. 
is are you also teaching like yin and vinyasa flow or are you focusing mostly on i noticed that you posted that you're teaching lead primary series are you are you holding down mysore classes or are you focusing mostly on like lead classes so the lead the lead classes i was i was covering for my friend um it's really like the program she got started again um and there so like I don't know exactly because, because it's really been her thing, but there were some Mysore classes for a while. And I think she's trying to start that up again. And we had talked about trying to do a little Ashtanga program together. The problem is, is that we do live in a small town and setting up a super early practice and not knowing if people are going to come and it's hard to reestablish that. So um, I think we'd like to, and she'd like to, and I would be, I would keep be game as well, but um yeah, I mean, right now I'm just teaching one regular class a week and then trying to add in privates as much as I can. Um, and it's 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 a vinyasa style class. I wouldn't, it's not pure Ashtanga, um, but it's definitely influenced by Ashtanga. And I try to add some restorative towards the end, but um, I would like to, I'd like to get more pure Ashtanga on the schedule where I am now. So we'll see. I hear you. It is a big commitment. It is. Yeah. It I is. hear you. Yeah. Is, so now that you've had the experience, it sounds like you had your own body work and or like small yoga studio for about 18 years, you said. Now, and so after having your own space and now working in other people's spaces, are you... Being that you've had the juxtaposition of both experiences, can you shed a little bit of light on... Are you really happy to not have all the responsibility that comes with holding down your own space? Does it seem like a little bit easier now? Or what what are your thoughts regarding those two different ways of going about it? Yeah, I mean, the Mysore program that I practiced, that community that I practiced within and and ended up taking over after my teacher left, um, that was at the studio where I'm teaching now. So it was um, under different ownership. But so we, you know, between the two of us had run that there for years and um, my little studio, I really sort of did that for my, just my personal clients, my one-on-one -on -one clients, because after years of doing body work and teaching Ashtanga yoga, um, I was really interested in going and studying yoga therapy and kind of incorporating more therapeutic um and not that Ashtanga is not therapeutic, of course, yoga chikitsa is yoga therapy, but um, wanting to just learn more, more broadly in the yoga therapy world um, to incorporate into my body work practice. Um, so opening up that little studio uh, was, was more about that and my one-on-one -on -one work and not so much about teaching my, my class. I was still teaching at the other studio when I had that. I see. Um, <clears throat> but some of, um, I had some friends who, who wanted to teach small classes or just practice in there. Um, so there wasn't really any conflict. Um, but now not having a full-time body work practice and, you know, yoga therapy practice, um, my life is completely different now. Just mm -hmm. my priority is my daughter and, yeah. um, going and teaching at a studio that I love is such a gift really I mean it's just um it feels really light to me not running my own yeah. <laughs> business yes yeah so yeah here yeah that's hardcore to do for a long time <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know sometimes I fantasize about it I, I I enjoy having a yoga center and don't want to change paths right now but it, but on some days I think Oh, it'd be so nice to just like show up and then yeah. you know, not have that pressure. So I totally, oh, that's why I wanted to ask you that. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Can you, so it sounds like you actually went, you, you went ahead and got certified as a C-I-A-Y-T. Is that correct? Um, so the, the school I went to wasn't like a Gary Craftsow. It was more, um, I didn't get certified as a yoga therapist. So the way that 
the way that we kind of talked about our schooling was more of like, we're deepening in yoga therapies. So, um, that is like a whole other thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, um, I think the way that they, that they described their program was that it was a, a therapy intensive, um, yeah. something, I don't know. Um, so a lot of it was, um, you know, learning, learning deeper Ayurvedic, um, sciences and, um, a lot of it was like based on, um, the Bihar tradition, which is, you know, the medical yoga system. Um, and so it was a combination of all that and a lot of just self-care practices and, um, diet and, you know, the whole range of yes. what you consider yoga therapies. So I'm not a yoga therapist as in the traditional, um, hardcore sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I know. I, I remember, I didn't know anything about any of that. And I remember with yoga Alliance, there was this thing where it was like, make sure you click this box and or sign that because of the RYT, I think what yoga yoga teachers were starting to say, we're registered yoga therapists. And then the yoga yeah. therapy crowd kind of said, whoa, 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 no, you're not. Yeah. If you want to be that, you got to do this over here. And I, I I was like kind of unaware of all that, unaware of all that. And then, and then I started to, go, oh, okay, now I get it. Um it's a really you, fun animal. Yeah. It is, isn't it? I, I'm so I'm curious because you said you got a chance to go to Mysore. Did you practice in uh Gokulam and or with Shra mm -hmm. and with Patabi Joyce? What year did you? So I was there. Patabi Joyce was still alive, um, but not teaching anymore when I was there. So I I did study with Shra. Um yeah. yeah, he is so I was there in 2008, 2009. Yeah. yeah. I, does that sound right? It does. It, it does. I think you're right. right. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. So yeah. we would see him just kind of sitting on the porch or whatever, just kind of yeah. taking it all in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm gathering then in, in relation to Ashtanga, you've relied more on your own personal practice versus relying on having like a authorize authorization level one level two am i correct or did you go that yeah, far there I never got authorized. so most of my ashtanga i mean i did so i apprenticed with my teacher for for two years and so she was her her school was was where i got my uh, initial training from mm -hmm. um and then just a lot of i mean practice of course um, you know, studying with senior teachers and yeah, uh, yeah. so no, I'm not authorized. <laughs> Can I, I have a lot of friends that are authorized and certified. So I have full respect for that path. Do you sometimes, I'm not authorized. Um, I've taken teacher trainings, you know, but with senior teachers, I'm curious, do you sometimes think that by just having a genuine love for practice and letting your uh, teaching come from having that love and not having the constraint of a sort of letter designation after you benefits you or suits you maybe like with your personality type, have you found that that's like a, just a more suitable way for you to go? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I ever felt like, I wanted to take my teaching that far of like going to India every year and, and putting in the time that it takes to, to be authorized, honestly, yeah. um, yeah. living in, I think if I was maybe trying to run a studio in a city, I would feel like that was more important. I live in a tiny town. Um, my friend that's running the program now actually did get authorized, um, mm -hmm. I think her last trip to India. So, so that's cool. Um, yeah. but no, I mean, I think just committing myself to the knowledge and the practice and the study and always trying to learn more and also being a body worker and having a pretty deep knowledge of the body and the different components of practice. And, um, 
you know, for me, that's felt like enough living where I live. It's just to be able to offer some wisdom where maybe there isn't a lot of it in that, um, in that department for the, yeah. for this lineage. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I have deep respect as well for that commitment and it's not something I ever really felt like was necessarily my path. I mean, maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe if I wasn't a mom or, you know, yeah. but, Understood. That's cool, Melissa. Well, I'm actually really happy to hear that because I'm on a similar um, <laughs> trajectory. So it's nice to meet someone else who who feels similar, similar similarly. Do um, so personally. That's why why I was excited to speak with you because you are a body worker and a yoga teacher. And when COVID hit, um, personally, because with body work, obviously we're nowhere near the six feet apart realm. We're like, right, literally making physical contact. And then from the, like doing a cis side, it really felt like the carpet just got pulled right out from underneath me in terms of everything I've put my, uh, you know, career and professional path, you know, in that, in that direction. So I'm curious, what was your experience with all that? Did, how did you process that whole experience of needing to pull back and yeah, I mean, so I I was on maternity leave during during that whole thing and sort of preparing myself to come out of it when COVID hit and um so it, it was just kind of like you were already there. Like you <laughs> you'd already like stop doing a ton of massages yeah. every day and teaching it emphasized my resolve to, yeah. <laughs> to not go back into it right away. Um yeah, I mean, having a four month old baby and not knowing what this whole thing was all about coronavirus and not understanding the depth of it and that it would be this, this two year plus, you know, yeah, catastrophe basically. So I, um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't there. I wasn't, I wasn't on the precipice of starting up again. So yeah. it, really yeah enhanced my resolve to to not not go there and um I th it, this is kind of big background information that I should say but um yeah I I I had back surgery um basically after doing body work for I don't know how many years was I into it at that point, 16 years or something into that point um, of being a body worker and having a full-time practice and having a full-time yoga practice and being a teacher. I um, one day basically bent down to pick up my dog's poop and <laughs> couldn't get back up again. I, I am. Um, oh. So well, I appreciate being honest about that. That's, that's, can you tell me where it was in your back and what actually happened? It was between L4 and L5. Um, I had such a badly herniated disc that it was complete. There was no space between the disc and my sciatic nerve. Um, and so I was in, I mean, it was more painful, honestly, than, <laughs> than it was being in labor for 45 hours in some ways. Um, just, um, excruciating, uh, pain and unable to walk. I mean, I was, I was laid up until steroids could take down the inflammation and eventually had surgery. Um, and, but, um, was it, a um, fusion? Um, no, fortunately it wasn't, it was, he just had to shave off what was, what was there. So there's very little disc left in there. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it, it was a big wake up call for me. Um, I had also been struggling with Ill, an Ill, illness uh, years prior to that. And mm. probably in part because of the illness, um, I just, my, I've got a hypermobility issue. And so my joints are really just hyper flexible. So um, <clears throat> probably wasn't getting the nutrients. My body wasn't absorbing the nutrients it needed. And so it just all kind of cascaded into this, um, being flat on my back basically. Um, yeah. so 
yeah, so it really put things into perspective and definitely deepened my, you know, what I could offer as a yoga teacher and as a body worker. I did go back into body work after that, after several months of healing from surgery and getting feeling back in my leg. And um, so. Was that part of the impetus to go down the therapeutic side of yoga? The therapeutic um, side I'd gone down already, that road. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was always, um, since I can remember, interested in healing and getting to the root of illness. And, um, you know, so I think, you know, getting sick and having a, an injury like that um, just deepened my um my knowledge and my love of being helpful to other people who are going through something similar. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I practiced for another couple of years, I guess, after, after the surgery, another, see, that was 2017. And yeah, so another couple of years after the surgery until I went on maternity leave. Um, and you know, it was a big, um, wake up call to how I practiced and, you know, had to get the hydraulic table and all the things that, you know, I should have done a long time ago, but it changed my yoga practice a lot. And I am so much more in love with my practice now than I ever have been after going through, you know, the things I went through with my health and my back and pregnancy and all of that. Um, so I'm so thankful to hear all that because I don't feel so alone <laughs> in relation to the challenges that come up with maintaining the physical rigor that's necessary for keeping up body work and, and teaching and, and practicing. Can you give me a little bit of insight into, like, I've noticed some of the pictures that you posted recently. Um, I saw you doing Karna Pidasana. You look pretty comfortable in Karna Pidasana, like real deep flexion with your knees by your that, ears. Is that yeah. an old? Is that, that, that's another picture. That was pre, pre-surgery. That's, that's pre-surgery. Um, can yeah. You, can you give me a little insight into then post-surgery, how you are navigating it and, and what movements have you needed to eliminate and or add to keep you feeling good? Yeah. Um. So really deep flexion for me doesn't doesn't feel great um and like there's certain certain forward bends that you know or like Dewey Pada Shirshasana things like that that I don't even know if I would attempt at this point in my life um just so the listeners know Dewey Pada Shirshasana both legs behind the head at the same time which I used to I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, flexion is an issue. That's like flexion on steroids. So um yeah. Yes. That makes sense. That makes it what about Pashimatanasana, flattening your body forward of your legs? Is there an issue like in terms of if your legs are together or if your legs are say like in a Upavista Konasana where your legs are separate, does it change the sensation element in your back or is all flexion kind of something that you have to be just really cautious with? Um, I would say all flexion on some level. I just don't go as deep yeah. and I don't. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think, you know, part of, part of my journey and, and becoming wiser around, around my practice has been like, you don't have to go as deep as you can, you know, especially when you're hypermobile. It's like the, I remember a teacher saying to me once, like, strength is better than flexibility. And that, that was early in my practice, um, you know, a long time ago. And that just, that just stuck with me. Unfortunately, not enough. I definitely pushed myself too far, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't matter really whether my legs are together or separate. I I tend to still practice with them together for most things. And sometimes I separate them. Um, like if I'm doing like Asana or something like that, sometimes I'll, you know, play around with how my legs are in that pose and, yeah. you know, like that. 
backbending is so therapeutic for me. I love, even though they're hard and, you know, some of them are really hard for me. Um, backbending feels great. Like I love nice. what for my spine. Yep. So I would say like this intermediate series, a lot of those poses feel more therapeutic to me now than and maybe they did already, but mm. then doing like a full primary series would. Yeah. So fascinating. Interesting. I, I have the reverse. I have a, I have no disc in between my L5 and S1 and mm. forward feels so good, but backward. Oh my gosh. I have to be so careful now. Um, so I, it's, it's great to hear how it can be one for the other. Like we have teacher trainers that'll come in. I'll try to explain that the assessment process of if someone has some sort of herniation, bulging disc and or degenerative disc issues that one of the first things we could maybe ask people is like, are you more comfortable going forward or are you more comfortable going backward? Not everybody knows that right away, but people that do have back issues quite often have figured that out. What is your experience in terms of working with students and say, now that you have this like really uh, experience, you have a direct experience with back issues and you get a chance to work with people that have the same thing, which I, I like that you mentioned earlier that like your ability to sympathize or empathize with students has improved because of your own personal growth that you've gone through with your yoga practice. Um, do you, what have you noticed in relation to asking people going forward and backward is, do you find it's predominantly forward? I heard someone throw a statistic at me recently. That's like 70 for 70% of people feel better going forward, 30 going backward when it's disc related issues in the lumbar. But I don't know if that's true or where they came up with that stat, but what have, what have you encountered? I mean, it's it's hard to say i think for for people who are traditional ashtanga practitioners i feel i mean we we learn the primary series first and we do that for years and you know we progress but um there's so much forward bending in primary so i i feel like there are a lot of with ashtanga practitioners who end up with lower back pain i feel like those forward bends become, become an issue after time. Um, yeah. and so in that world, like, and that's, and that's just what I've witnessed, um, which is not, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I understand. So we all, have our, we all have our small little group we're working with, so we don't know if that's representative of the entire globe, but right. that is yeah. a, still a great observation. That's cool. Um, but I mean, it's, I guess it just really depends on the injury. And yeah. if I'm working with somebody therapeutically, I mean, I like to really get to know intimately, like what all their injuries are, even from childhood, like just, you know, to get a, get the big picture of, um, you know, cause sometimes something doesn't feel as good, but it's actually what's therapeutic. And sometimes something feels easy and it's not therapeutic. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, trying to figure out that dance of, um, Good point. Yeah. Know, that, that thing that I, I say as a yoga teacher and a lot of yoga teachers say all the time, which is like, do what feels right for your body. And it's like, I believe that on some level, um, for sure, but also are we doing things that are enhancing, um, a problem? because that's what feels normal to us, even if it's not necessarily what's helping, um, you know, the outcome of, of your practice, be it because you have an injury or you're trying to get to a certain um, goal with your practice or whatever it is. Good point. Has your realization and or experience helped improve your meditation practice and or appreciation for like like really simple easy happy mm -hmm. <laughs> like yoga with no pressure on it type of practice <laughs> I mean I think in general since since I've had surgery and had you know a baby and like 
rebuilding my practice post that era. Um, that alone, whether it's my meditation practice or just my, my yoga practice in general, my approach is so different than it used to be. It's just, I mean, it's, my approach is different. My appreciation is different. Um, in some things I feel stronger than I ever have, maybe because I'm not doing body work full time or, I mean, I don't know. My awareness is just greater than it, than it was. Um, so I feel like, um, you know, where it, where meditation comes in, I mean, doing a practice to still the mind and get to that place of asana for meditation. Um, I don't need to practice for two and a half hours anymore <laughs> to get there. You know, I can do a half hour practice and feel like I'm where I need to be that day or, you know, so, um, in that sense, it's changed. Good answer. I noticed on your Instagram profile, you had one, a description, um, that you call yourself a naturalist. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me think you love nature. Can you, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about how you are able to weave your love for nature into either your yoga or your jewelry making and, or being a mom or, um, how are you bringing your love of uh, being a natural or how are you bringing your natural aside into your other aspects? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a thread for me um, that goes through everything in my life. I mean, I love, um, I love, you know, the proverbial great outdoors and, and animals and plants and all of it. Um, I definitely consider myself an environmentalist since I was young. Um, I think we started the first environmentalist club in my high school, you know, at the age of 13 or whatever. <laughs> so um, that's always been a big part of my drive is, is like being an advocate for mother nature and the environment. I thought I wanted to go to law school to be, you know, a lawyer for environmental causes. And um, I, <laughs> That, that's not where I ended up but um I mean with my daughter we spend I spend as much time outside with her as I can and definitely try to teach her about how closely connected we are with all living things and um try to you know she loves being outside and she loves she's she's a little tree hugger at the age of three I mean she she sees trees as beings just like I do. She really does and um, loves animals. We spend time uh, farm sitting when we can for this family farm. And um, yeah, I think part of, um, part of where I bring the natural world in spiritually is I've studied shamanism for a long time, um, which kind of, it takes some of the the energies from you know nature and the natural world in general, just animals and plants and um, directions and all that into. Sometimes I use that as I when I teach yoga, um, and also Ayurveda. I mean the elements and how they exist in the body, and so really, I mean I incorporate it. It it's not separate for, for me, it's just kind of part of existence for me and how I try to teach my daughter and teach others or, you know, teach others about healing and, um, yeah. Very cool. Are you a fan of Neil Young by chance? Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard his newest album world record? Um, I'm, I don't know if I've listened to it, like, front to back, but I maybe I've heard some of the songs. I'm not sure. I heard him uh, recently. Uh, he was on Howard Stern. And mm -hmm. so I was listening to that interview and I love Neil Young and I've been a big fan of him since I was uh, back in, in high school days. And uh, he's such an environmentalist and mm -hmm. I love on his new record and listening to him speak with Howard, how passionate he is about how important 
it is that we focus on yeah. loving the earth, like mm-hmm. actually putting love into our connection to the earth. And um, so I appreciate everything that you're saying. Do you have any other ideas of ways that people like, because I thought it was interesting because I heard him say that like, we're just not even really feeling like we have any connection to the earth. Like we could go all day long and not once actually have any sort of like where we're cultivating love for appreciation for nature and, and, and our, where we're standing. And um, do you, what are, what are some of your ideas and thoughts or practices that help you to stay grounded on that level? I, I mean, I think part of the biggest disconnect for us in modern times is, you know, we're attached to our screens and our phones, obviously it's, I mean, kind of goes without saying nowadays, but I think, you know, for me, like the very simple practice of going outside and literally just sitting under a tree and either putting my forehead against the tree or putting my back against the tree and just breathing that energy, you know, into my body um, and into my mind and allowing myself to, you know, the little meditation I like to do where I, you know, I sit with the tree and I visualize, you know, energy coming up from the roots of the tree into my own body and going back down into the earth and, um, yeah, so for me, literally just sitting with a tree <laughs> is, is sometimes all I need to, to, you know, come back to earth if I've been on my computer too much, or if I'm feeling emotionally dysregulated or whatever it is. Um, yeah, just taking a few breaths under a tree. That's a great one, Melissa. It Like when's the, I, I feel like I don't ever see anyone glorifying or celebrating that simple act of like sitting and putting your back against the tree. Like why we don't really get that image very often, unless we were to like to specifically search out like hashtag sit against the tree. I don't know. It's something that like focuses on that, but that's a great idea. And it's also a great way to, I mean, there are definitely people that live in cities that don't get that aren't around nature very much or haven't been exposed to much of the natural world away from that environment um you know i think that's one of the ways that we are going to help our planet is by not preaching to the choir necessarily but getting those people that don't have that energetic connection to trees or to the soil or whatever in into nature and get them connecting with that feeling of like, oh, yeah. there's something greater than me here. And um when I when I see pictures of Telluride, like it looks so majestic and otherworldly. Is there an energy there that's like profound? Uh, obviously you've you like it and you've stayed there. Um is there it's gotta be pretty amazing to live there. I mean, just looking at the photos of the mountains and the peaks and even the aerial photos that I've seen of the town, it looks like such a tiny little town, like a one road kind of like post office and grocery store type of town. (laughs) It just looks amazing. Have you found that living there, it does help you to have that really intense uh, connection to nature more so than anywhere else you've lived? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think I grew up playing in the outdoors and always, always having a connection to nature. Um, and I think part of the reason I moved out here, I mean, yes, there was an energy here that had to do with the people, but ultimately it was because I had a connection with the natural world here and how it felt to me. Um, because I kind of knew I wanted to live in the mountains and had had a profound experience coming from the East coast into the mountains as a teenager and just kind of Mm. knew that this is Colorado was where I wanted to be. Um, So when my sister moved here, it definitely was just the impetus for me to, to get my butt out here too. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, I've lived here almost 25 years now and I'm still in awe 
mm. every day. I mean, I, I can go out my back door and hike up and, and get that five minute tree meditation and feel so much better or whatever, feel grounded or feel clear. Um, so yeah, it doesn't take much. Um, but that is, you know, in, in 25 years of being here and watching the town change and watching, you know, the influx of so much um, money and like these different things that um, have changed the town, um, the nature has stayed the same. You know, that's that's kind of the constant is the, the woods, the mountains have stayed pretty much the same. So um, yeah. And it, it still is a magical little town too. I mean, there is that for sure. So right. there's a great community here. Yeah. That's so cool, Melissa. Well, I really hope to get a chance to come practice at your, where you're teaching and come see Telluride sometime. Uh, as we're, I want to be really respectful of your time. And as we're coming in close on our, actually we, we've come around closer on our hour mark. Do you have You've, you've shared so many wonderful ideas and thoughts, so you don't have to add anything else here. Um, but I'm curious if you have a um, closing statement and or a message to close with. Is there something mm. that you would like to add? Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, one of the things I've thought about a lot recently as my practice has changed um because i mean i'm a mom of, i'm in my 40s i you know have walked a path and um you know long before i ever had a child i i knew that i wanted to break some of the cycles before i had my own child of like the stuff that we bring into the world and we learn from our ancestors and our families and um so you know learning to have so much compassion with that and on my yoga journey seeing where I was like in my 20s and then my 30s with it um my the wisdom part of me now like the advice I would say to anyone who loves yoga or is is learning about it is like don't use your practice as as a an excuse or a reason to judge yourself or others like use it as a way to grow deeper compassion for yourself and the world you know and to always have that beginner's mind because um yeah yoga is about finding presence and i think presence so much of presence is is love boils down to that so yeah well said mm -hmm. thank you melissa welcome thank you so much i really appreciate uh you taking the time to speak with me today thank you thank you i i will stay in touch and neil young lives just down the road does he really yeah. <laughs> does he have a pad and tell you right i didn't know that it's he lives on on one of the mesas yeah oh man I know. I love, he's got that one song. I'm thankful for my country home. And, uh, I just, ah, uh, I know, I don't know my, my parent, my good friend's parents had all the Neil Young records. And I remember when I first started listening to him, like when I started listening to harvest, when I was in high school, I was just something about that album. Just like, I just yeah. couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. I recently just got another copy of it on vinyl. Cause I, I still play that thing over and over again. I love Neil. And then I saw Neil play um, in Miami in 1991 and he had Sonic Youth open up for them. And so like, there's this kind of older hippie crowd that I think were like, had no idea who Sonic Youth was. And I had no idea who Sonic Youth was and they just shredded it. Sonic Youth was so amazing. And that most of the crowd were a little older, kind of going, they like had this look like boo, like they were just like really uh, turned off by the intensity of Sonic Youth, but which made me even love Neil more because I thought what a cool thing to bring out a band that's completely opposite to like what <laughs> Neil's music was like at the time, um, which made me fall in love with them even more. So um, that's cool. That's even more reason to go to Telluride, although Neil probably doesn't want a bunch of paparazzi 
trying to stall come out on his mesa but <laughs> i mean he played a couple of um he played a couple of shows here a few years ago i was just coming off the grand canyon a boating trip on the grand canyon and he played a couple of shows here oh, wow. um but i mean i don't think people don't see him around very much but um yeah harvest is a big one for for me too oh, like yeah. in junior high and on. Oh, yeah. um but yeah um, it's almost emotional, isn't it? Harvest, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely evokes a certain. It, it it evokes a certain. Yeah. Feeling for sure. It definitely had to do with. Um, yeah. The roundabout way, my connection with the mountains and wanting to move to the mountains in the west as well. But um, yeah, I'll have to I'll have to listen to that his new album front to back because I so good. Oh my! And Rick Rubin. <laughs> um did the engineering who's a total legend which even made me go what rick rubin and neil are teaming up for this one and uh it's i guess listening if you get a chance to hear how he wrote these tunes and how you would just go out in the woods and walk around and just start whistling and then just like from there just come up with this song and they're all just like really simple like love earth love nice earth. yeah Sounds amazing oh. Yeah. When we hit it, search, but search for it. <laughs> cool, Melissa. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate it. And um, I look forward to catching up again here in the, in the future. Thank you so much. I feel like now I want to hear all about you. So <laughs> well, we'll, we'll flip it. We'll, we'll flip it next time. <laughs> for sure. All right. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. <laughs> too. I appreciate it.